of Jesus Christ, the rock of refuge to which we can always go. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this morning we meditate on our gospel lesson previously read. Let me tell you about a man who was well acquainted with death. Before this young man even reached his 14th birthday, both of his parents had died. He lived during a time period called the Thirty Years' War, during which soldiers swept into his town, destroyed 400 buildings in that town, including his childhood home and his church. And then after the soldiers were gone, came a plague, which killed another 300 people in that same town, one of which was his brother. Despite his turbulent and tragic childhood, this man studied to become a pastor. Several years later, he was married and he had five children, three of whom died in infancy, and one died just a little bit later. Then his wife, overcome by all the grief and hardship of losing her children, she died as well leaving but one six-year-old child to her husband. And if all that wasn't enough, in the midst of that, this man was removed from his office as pastor because he would not compromise the Word of God and gloss over some differences when others were looking to unite without really being united. So he was removed as a pastor. Who is the man who lived this mournful story? It's the same man who wrote the hymn that we just sang a moment ago. A man named Paul Gerhardt, widely recognized as the greatest of the Lutheran hymn writers. And that song that we just sang a moment ago, though its title in our hymn book, Why Should Cross and Trial Grieve Me, sounds a bit sad and somber. That hymn actually appeared first in German hymnals with 12 stanzas under this title, A Christian's Hymn of Joy. You might think, joy? Where can joy be found for that man? How could he possibly have joy in the face of everything that he lived through? Walking through life with death hiding around every corner, waiting to take another one of his dear loved ones. How could this man find joy? If there was ever a man that we could hardly blame if he sat down, sat down next to Job in bitterness and misery, it would be Paul Gerhardt. And yet... The legacy of the hymns that Paul Gerhard has left to us is characterized by one unbelievably ex- unexpected theme. See if you can pick it out from a number of his hymn titles. Once again, my heart rejoices. Calm your hearts and voices raising. Awake my heart with gladness. Rejoice my heart, be glad and sing. All my heart this night rejoices. Joy, gladness, rejoicing. How does a man who endured what he endured sing the songs that he sang? He knew the rock of refuge to which he could always go, and he fled to that refuge when his parents died, and when his brother died, and when his children died, and when his wife died, and when finally he took his last breath and died. And we need to find that same refuge as well, or we will dry up in bitterness and rage and anger at God and die on the vine. We need to find the rock of refuge. So the stage is set for the way that our gospel lesson begins. As a panicked father runs to Jesus, looking for someone who can possibly do something. His little daughter is dying. The text says she's literally at the end. 
We don't know where he started his journey. We don't know how many people he tried to find some help from, but we know that he hadn't found any yet. So finally, he's come to the one man who's been healing every dread disease and driving out demons. This has to be the one who can help him. This has to be the man who can heal her. If only they can get back in time before she dies. So the man, wasting no time at all, he bends at Jesus' feet. He's, he pleads earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and lived. And so Jesus went with him. Except there was only one problem. Traffic along the way was at a standstill. Because people were crowding in on Jesus just trying to touch him in order to be healed. And one particular woman who was able to reach out and just touch the clothes of Jesus ended up holding up this whole procession because Jesus felt the power go out from him that healed this woman who had been subject to bleeding for the last 12 years. You can almost imagine Jairus watching this wonderful miracle that ought to have been a vote of confidence for him, if anyone was going to help his daughter, it was the one who just healed this woman. Yet you could almost imagine Jairus staring at his watch, thinking, Jesus, come on, stick to the itinerary, man. We got to get back to my daughter before she dies. Then comes the worst news any parent could ever possibly hear. Some people come from Jairus' house and give him the news. Your daughter is dead. What's left to do? What's left to say? Death has struck once again for his little daughter, his only child, the apple of his eye, and Jairus melts into the ground because now his daughter is dead, and it seems that there's nothing more to do. Death has won its victory again. That's the way that the people who brought the news were thinking as well, because they say, why bother the teacher anymore? See, they had come to trust and expect the nearly unavoidable rule that had come down through the history of the earth. It was God's consequence for mankind's fall into sin all the way back in the garden. God said, to dust you will return. That had held true nearly every single time. You had to go back nearly 800 years to the time where anybody was reported in the Bible being raised from the dead, all the way to the time of Elijah and Elisha. And it appears that at this time, nobody around had heard that Jesus had recently raised the widow of Nain's son from the dead, and so they just expected the string to continue. The string that started all the way back in Genesis chapter 5 where Moses reports the first genealogies of the world, starting with Adam. Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. And on down through the line, the same refrain repeats itself over and over again in the chapter, and then he died, and then he died, and then he died all the way on down to us, all the way on down to Jairus' 12-year-old daughter who had now died. Death had struck again, and there was no trifling with it. It seemed that all hope was lost, and it was over. But death is not the end for the prince of life. And Jesus is about to begin imparting a vastly different perspective to Jairus as he overhears what those men had said. Jesus tells Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. Jairus is now going to have to wait to see the Lord at work, to see his timing and his purpose in this, in his life in the life of his little daughter. So Jesus sends everyone away except for Peter, James, and John, and he goes to the house where he finds a huge, a huge commotion because the custom of the day was that you would hire professional mourners 
who would mourn for the person until the day of the burial. And so when Jesus arrives, he finds the commotion and he asks kind of an off the wall question, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. You know what they did? They laughed at him, thinking, who is this man who thinks that he's going to mess with death? Nobody messes with death. It's unconquerable. It's unquenchable. It comes for us all. So they laughed at him. But Jesus was about to begin revealing a truth that wouldn't be fully revealed until Easter Sunday. A truth about who is truly in charge of death. Let me tell you, it is not death. So Jesus, with the three disciples and father and mother standing over the child, utters just two words. Talitha kum. Little girl, I say to you, get up. One commentator mentions that these might have been words that her mother would have used every morning to tell her, get up, it's time for breakfast. And just like that, the little girl stood up and began to walk around. The most amazing miracle that they had seen in centuries, Jesus raising a little girl from the dead, and he equates it to nothing but waking her up from a sleep. So it was true what he had said before. She is not dead, but asleep. That's the one you want by your side, the one who raises the little child from the death, the one who is not ruled by death because he is the resurrection and the life. That's the difference between being in Christ and outside of Christ. Without Christ, death is a terrible thing, something to be avoided at all costs, something we spend our life trying not to have happen to us. Without Christ, death is the bitter end. It is the beginning of eternal death, body and soul, far away from the presence of God. Without Christ, death is a brutal mass murderer, a sadistic serial killer bent on the genocide of the nations. But in Christ, death is something totally different. Death is but a sleep, and death can never kill us. Death can never kill us because it has been robbed of its power. It's like a prison house with no warden and no guards and no bars. And that's because of what Jesus has done to death. Christ shared our humanity so that he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Or as Paul put it in our Second lesson today, when he said, Christ Jesus has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So death can never kill us because it is only a sleep. And Christ Jesus has put death to death by his resurrection and his life. That's our refuge. That's the one who makes us safe. That's the one who comforts us in the stage of every grief as we face death. That's the one that we must find, and that's the one that, Jesus, that Jairus found on that day. On the day his daughter died and was raised again, Jairus found out just exactly who Jesus is. He watched as Jesus reversed death to life. What an amazing story that is, and a treasure of our faith. Do you ever find a little bit of spite spooking around in the back of your mind that says, well, great for you, Jairus. I'm glad Jesus was there to raise your daughter from the dead. But what about all the loved ones that I've lost? My grandpa died, my uncle, my aunt, then my mother, and then my grandmother, all in the span of four years while I lived at seminary, where was Jesus to raise them from the dead? 
I know you have loved ones as well, young and old, all dearly loved that you've lost. Where was Jesus to raise them? And the answer for every believer in Christ, and I do not say this lightly or tritely, is that they never truly died. Certainly their soul sleeps in the dust of death, but their Certainly their body sleeps in the dust of death, but their soul lives, awaiting the bodily resurrection to life everlasting. Remember what Jesus said to Martha at the graveside of her brother Lazarus? Jesus said, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus asked Martha. Yes, Lord, she said. And that's the same yes of faith that Jesus calls us to believe when he gives us the command he gave to Jairus. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Simple, childlike trust that Jesus is our rock of refuge That's what the gospel calls us to. And it seems like a tall order in the face of grief and emotion and everything that comes when a loved one dies. And yet the gospel gives the faith for which it calls. And this is how we can cling to the rock of refuge in the face of death. This is how we can live with true joy, even when death looms large around us. This is how we can carry on in the faith of men who have gone before us singing songs of joy when all other men would cry. Jairus found his refuge in Jesus, the same refuge that Paul Gerhard found, and he learned the truth that death is but a sleep. We know that from Paul Gerhard's last words from the hymn that we sang before, actually the eighth verse of that hymn from a Christian's hymn of joy. Paul Gerhard wrote the theme that we meditated on today, death can never kill us. He said, death can never kill us even, but relief from all grief to us then is given. It doth close life's mournful story, make a way that we may pass to heavenly glory. Death is but a sleep. O Lord, grant to us a blessed end, for our times are in your hands. Amen. Please stand. Hey, thank you so much for checking out some of the content from Mount Olive Church. If you liked what you saw today, we would love it if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel or over on Spotify, subscribe to get Sermon Podcast Weekly. Also, if you checked out our sermon today, go over to mountoliveappleton.com and sign the friendship register so we know that you were blessed by our work today. God's blessings to you.